Hey, welcome to the Mad Angels podcast. It's your host, Mad Angels. Out here, we out here. Went skateboarding today outside. It was like minus six, so I was out there for about an hour. It was it was incredible. It was so incredible. Uh, very, 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 very good outside. I had, I had a good time. I'm just trying to move out of the way so you can see. I've been working on a lot of visual art now. Been working on a lot of visual art, actually. Uh, you can see that right there. That's my album cover, except it has a parental advisory. Uh, the reason my album cover has got a cross on it, but a, a parental advisory, maybe I'll talk about that in, when the album comes out. I've set a due date for my record. It's going to be 420 in honor of the substance that birthed it. I actually haven't smoked weed in about a month. I broke edge, actually, not after doing it for like a month. I broke edge yesterday because I felt I respected it. The reason I quit is is because I didn't want to be a junkie. That's all. I just don't want to be a junkie. With all due respect to, to, to drug users, you know, it's like I just don't want to be someone scraping res and trying to get high or whatever you know it's just like no I respected it so but I'm good I threw out I had like a couple crumbs left in a grinder and I threw them out actually because I'm like I'm good like I played music yesterday and I felt like even and and after I had smoked like a J with a friend of mine and I was like oh damn like I this is great like I feel great actually about this so um I but I like I said I respect that I respect it respect it you know res- um respect the technique as Eric B and Rakim would say in their song so but it's not something I really want to do in the future because I feel smarter without doing it you know but I've been having red wine and that sort of thing so you know uh this podcast is uh it's gonna be about at the drive-in you know uh, I-, I thought about researching and doing as much research as I can but to be honest with you the best thing to do is just for me to speak my personal experience, speak my personal truth, talk about their records, and uh, that's it. That's going to be it, you know, because uh, it'll come from the heart that way. You know, with the Jaws podcast that I did, episode six, I did a lot of research, as in I watched all the Jaws films. I watched, like, another movie about sharks, uh, Saving Jaws. I, I, I got really into it. With the Rodney Mullen podcast, again, very like, I got really into, like... The, the, the trivia and the and the history you know one of the things i'm not a very good skateboarder i'm not a good skateboarder you know and i'll i'll be the first to admit it i don't but i don't care about that that's a problem when i was younger that's why i quit when i was a kid because i was like well i'm terrible at this i'm not getting any better cuz when i was a kid i didn't understand how things profligate over time i didn't understand that so for me i was like uh, <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to do this. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to quit and do something else because I'm not getting the results. But now that I'm older and I understand how things, you do them every day and you get better and better and better gradually. It's kind of like a, like an RPG, you know? Life is like an RPG. You just do it day by day by day and everything gets gradually better. That's why RPGs and, like, you know, games like Fallout are so addictive because there's objectives and you can just do them. You can hammer away at smaller things every, every day. If you look at life like, a, like that, it's, it's like dope. It's like yeah make a to-do list and do it just like uh just like you're playing fallout fallout 3 or fallout new vegas or i didn't really play fallout 4 or fallout uh 76 for that matter not that many people play fallout 76 anyways but you get the idea but anyways i've been working on some visual art and uh and of course i got the classic uh the cream campbell ghetto bird classic poster that i made then uh grant britain's uh rodney mullen airwalk love that one amputexture i've got lizzie armanto as well too over there and uh jamie thomas leap of faith as well as my zero bold board i've got my uh my i have a rodney mullen almost complete as well too that i might use in the summer but i've also got uh my my mark gonzalez the gons uh, board, a uh, crooked board, his, his board that just came out like this year, basically. So I've got that. I've actually got some hooks over where my be- where my bedroom kind of area. I guess you could call it bedroom because I live in a studio apartment, but bedroom area. I got some hooks, and I'm gonna put up my uh, my Mark Gonzalez board on the left for now until my zero board breaks, if it ever does. I've heard, you know, that zero boards last forever, so I'm probably gonna be good. But I'm gonna put up my Mark Gonzalez, my Gons board on the left. I'm gonna put up a Mullen flea bag almost series board in the middle and then on the right i got this board that's by jeremy klein and if you know jeremy klein is if you're into skateboarding you know that uh uh he's founder of hookups uh he's a legend a very very legendary guy i bought a board from him at the end of uh, january 22nd it took a long time for it to get into canada and for me to get it for some reason i didn't have to pay duty on it i was so surprised i was like what the hell like i, I didn't have to pay any taxes or duty on it whatever i'm cool with that but 
but I've got a, a, a Rama one half, Rama one half uh, skateboard that he made. It's very, ex- it's not explicit, but it's 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 you know, it's very, uh, it's a it's cute. It's a cute board. I, I'm a big fan of Rama, which is why I bought it. I was like, yo, but he made this Akira board. I, I was like, oh my god, I should buy that. But my credit card is pretty uh, not stoked with my performance. I would say it's pretty not happy with my like. I, I've basically been reenacting the film Akira with my credit card, unfortunately. So I can't really be buy. I want to buy a flea base. It's like pink signature flea base. It's two thousand dollars. I kind of want to just blow the money on it and just get it. But I'll be in a lot of debt. More that it'll take me years to pay that off and all this. So I, I can't be doing stuff like that. Plus, I already have my fret list that I use. But anyways, my uh, yeah, my album. That's gonna be the album cover, but uh, without the Mad Angels part. And it will have a uh, parental advisory sticker on it because I swear a lot, especially in my more hip hop rap tracks. It's a lot of cursing. So. And as well, too, it's like there's no indie rock band on the planet that has a parental advisory sticker on on their record. And, you know, I don't I'm not really aspiring to be uh, an indie rocker anymore, uh, to be honest with you. So uh, that's just how it is. Just give me a second, y'all. There we go. Yeah, I just want to, I'm always trying to like figure out ways to uh, make things better and to have like better sound and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, my computer fan, you could hear it on the podcast, which is kind of gnarly, but, uh, you know, I'm figuring it out. This is episode, this would be episode eight now. Okay, good. Uh, I got to get into the double digits. I haven't done a podcast in a couple weeks. Like I said, uh, I made a release date for my record. It's going to be 420, so I'm probably going to work on that for the next solid month. I think what I want to do is after every day that I work, I finish work, work on the record. Like work on the backing tracks, work on the, uh, work on the, put the parts in the guitar parts and the, backing tracks and then on the weekends I'll go to the studio in the mornings and hammer out the vocal takes that's what I'm going to do that's my plan and I'm going to have it out in 420 because my spirit is just sick my spirit is sick of of having it in my system it's when you're an artist and you make or you make records you make art you make sculptures you dance whatever your spirit hurts if you don't do that stuff that's that's what separates people who do this because they think it'll make them money or they they've been trained to do it for monetary reasons from people who are like actually like a real artist you have to like your soul has to do it you know for me like I have to do it I can't like there's no uh, there's nothing like I have to do it it's interesting because I quit pot right I quit smoking weed and then you know it's like my bo- like my body's like yo okay play you have to play music then you have to make art you have to make music and you have to do something because i have so much energy and before i would just smoke weed you smoke a bit of weed and then you don't feel crazy you're like okay good everything's good with the world i don't have to do anything like that but with uh when you when you quit when i quit i and i i haven't smoked weed and um you know i did it yes yesterday to break edge haha <laughs> but i didn't do it for like Oh, four weeks before that four weeks of just about before that and that's the longest I've gone in like 13 years without doing it so I'm, I'm pretty happy about that I'm really really happy about it so uh, that's something I'm gonna keep up you know but again I have no I have no ill will against weed it's just that like hey like my time has passed for that like maybe when I'm with my friends or something or I have a good long-term relationship with someone that I love fair enough but also I'm not going to complain about my dating life anymore on my podcast (laughs) it's because my mom is my even my mom is sick of hearing it she's my mom told me point blank the other day in in a family zoom meeting she's like she's like shut up about your dating problems and I was like oh my mom my mom is the best man she just like she has like she gives no f's bro like she just does not care about that stuff which makes me like inspired i'm like yeah screw that so this episode uh is about just getting i'm getting all the pleasantries the early pleasantries out of the way but this episode specifically about at the drive-in i'm not going to talk about i'll talk about mars volta a little bit but i think mars volta deserves its own podcast i feel like it deserves its own episode i feel like for this uh, I should just focus on at the drive-in. Maybe focus, like maybe talk about, you know, um, a little bit about Sparta, a little bit about Mars Volta if it comes up. But it, it really, I wanted to do an episode solidly about at the drive-in, very, very specifically about at the drive-in. Uh, where to start with that? So it's very. So for me, when I was a kid, 
uh, At The Drive-In is kind of a band that I can always associate in my life with burned CDs. And what I mean by that is when I was living in Ontario, suburban Ontario in Canada, if y'all are in America, you don't know what the hell it is. Good. Yeah, of course you're not going to know what the hell that is. Whenever I toured America... And played venues. I played Don Pedro, which is where At The Drive-In did play when I was younger in a band, uh, in in one of the many bands that I've been in in my life. Yeah, I, I played at Don Pedro, At The Drive-In played there, but no one knew that. Like, when I, we were touring in America, you'd be like, they're like, oh, where are you from? You're from Canada? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm from Canada. They're like, where are you from there? And I'm like, K-, uh, I would start saying the name of the city. I'd be like, eh, and they, they just would immediately not know what the hell it is. They'd be like, what the hell is that? They, they just wouldn't even pay attention. So I don't bother with that kind of stuff. They don't really bother with it. So anyways, when I was younger living in suburban Ontario and Canada or the suburbs, you could just say the suburbs because it's basically the same no matter where you go. Suburbs are the same. My friend and his brother, his brother was really talented. His brother's a really talented BMX uh, bike rider. He has a, a good business now, actually. He's a different business, but he's a really talented BMX rider, like the best around. He's like the best in the city, one of the best in the city. And my friend, my best friend, he would like get all these at the drive in, all this music, like Tool at the drive in, Perfect Circle, amongst other bands. Uh, and he would get that like music from his brother. And then him and I would just listen to it. And one of the first songs I ever heard was he made me a mix CD because he got a CD burner. This is the first time a CD burner, first time a CD burner was, was like I, I ever even thought about it. Nowadays, we don't even think about that kind of stuff. It doesn't even like, it doesn't even register technology goes so fast. But I was, I remember I was a kid and he got a CD burner and I, it was the, the biggest thing because before that you'd have to go to the record store and you'd pay like twenty seven ninety nine. like at the drive-in albums on CD were twenty seven ninety nine, and that was in that day's money that was in 2002 money not 2021 money just to let you know and my friend would get a he would get a mix he would make me a mix CD and he put Napoleon solo on one of the mix CDs and it was the first at the drive-in song I ever heard and I was like what the hell like what the hell is this and it my in when i was in high school middle school like growing up after i moved back from america south carolina yeah it was just like at the driving became an obsession you know i love tool and i love perfect circle and rage against the machine and all these bands pearl jam we were listening to and all this but at the driving really stuck with me and i obsessed i'm just obsessed over the band and I never knew what they, they you know, it's, it's interesting to think about it because I didn't know what they were at all. Like, I only heard them. I only heard their music before I ever saw a live video. So I had no idea what the hell they were. Nowadays, I mean, it's like you go on YouTube, it's like at the driving performance. There's going to be like a thousand videos. You can watch them perform, you know, when they were really young. You could watch them perform when In Casino Out came out. You could watch them perform when Via and Relationship Command came out. You could watch them perform new shows when they played in like, you know, Argentina or whatever. And they played the new record, which I'll get to in a bit. But back in my day, it's like you could... I'm an old man. I'm an old man. I'm not. I'm not ashamed to admit it. My hair is brown, but uh, it's gray. It's gray at the temples, that's for sure. But back in my day, it's like I had no idea what they looked like. I had no idea. I just heard Napoleon solo, and I was like, "Yeah, this is it." Because you know, when I was in grade seven, living in South Carolina, it was Blink One Eighty Two and Sum Forty One, and then I heard at the drive, and I was like damn like this is this has the intensity and the distorted guitars i guess you could say of those bands but it's much more expressive it's much more artful it's much less like you know with all due respect to uh, to blink 182 and some 41 it's like it's much more uh it makes a lot more sense it makes a lot more sense artistically for me personally very very artistic a very artistic band and it really inspired me. Like I was like, this is this is real art. And I remember being in high school, and At the Drive was my favorite band. I got a, I got one of their shirts. I got a shirt of theirs from Hot Topic. We, like, we drove down to America to visit a friend of ours from South Carolina a couple of years later after we lived in Canada again, and we and we visited them. And I went to a Hot Topic, and you know. Everyone talks smack about Hot Topic. Like literally, everybody talks smack about it. But I I got a Not The Drive-In shirt from there. I saw one on the wall, and I was like, I need it. I was like, 
parents, can you please buy it to me? And they're like, oh, okay, fine. You're strange. But, and I still have it actually. I, I don't, it's, it's hanging over my wall, but, um, I have an at the drive-in shirt. Actually, what the hell? I'll just bring it over. Just hold tight for a minute. Uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to grab it and I'm going to put it on my, my camera. Just give me a sec. Pardon the delay, all eight, all seven people who saw this podcast. Here it is. This is the original shirt. I still have it from Hot Topic. All these years later, there's holes in it. Uh, you can't really see it too well because of the lighting and all this, but there's holes in it, um, holes all over the place. And on the on the shirt itself, I put two trinkets. This is an this is an at the drive-in button from their new record, their new era before they split again and there's also a spoon and I found this this button it's a button or it's a badge but it's a spoon and I found it in a Montreal like in Montreal they have a couple of these bins or these uh these boxes are outside these like milk they're kind of like mailboxes there but you put books in them and people pick up a book or leave a book and I looked in one and there was a spoon and it has Puerto Rico on it Puerto Rico on it and I kept it, you know, originally I kept it because I was going to use it to shovel weed into my gosh darn apparatus, but I kept it because that's where Omar is from. Omar from at the drive and is from Puerto Rico. That's, that's his home country, you know, where he's from. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to put that on this shirt because that makes sense. Uh, I'm going to put this up in a second, but um, just give me a moment. <laughs> Probably a little bit of feedback. A feedback on a podcast. That's pretty poor. But anyways, I got it in the back there. But uh, recently, uh, Johnny Pacheco, who's played in the Fania All Stars, he's a band leader, very legendary guy. He passed away. It was a. It was a. It was. It's sad. I mean, he's 85 years old. He got pneumonia. It's very. It's sad because he basically invented salsa, like the term salsa, even you know. And uh, Cedric from At the Drive in Mars Volta, he posted about it on his on his Instagram page and I, I posted on there too and I was like hey like I got into that band because of you and Omar and uh, it changed my life for real because I, I didn't under you know when you hear um when you hear like salsa music when you know you don't really think about it or it doesn't really occur to you but something that i'm very thankful for is that a lot of like latin music uh, i've i've had exposure to a lot of latin music in my life you know when you're in a small city or small town or something you don't always get that kind of exposure and luckily like i've been very exposed to a lot of cool things i mean that's that's getting back to at the drive and at the drive was the gateway was the gateway drug so to speak for pretty much everything in my life you know music um salsa music uh, more i would always try to find bands that sounded like at the drive-in so like you know q and not you comes to mind immediately a lot of other post hardcore bands bear versus Sh bear versus shark comes to mind as well too you know a lot of emo bands a lot of like post hardcore kind of bands but um Johnny Pacheco passed away, unfortunately, and Cedric posted about it, and I was like, yo, like, I, I, got, in, I got into that uh, Fania All-Stars and their music because of you guys, and that changed my life, and it's sad to hear about it, and I was like, you know, Hector Laveau, who, who sang with the Fania All-Stars, which is who's a star in his own right, has movies about him and all this. Uh, I love his, his singing. I really love the way he sings. There's a song, Mi Gente, uh, that he plays. And um, it's about, I think, from what I can gather, again, maybe I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, put it in the comments. Like, uh, and I don't, I mean, like, I'm not trying to be uh, a fool or anything, but um, it's about the people of Puerto Rico, basically. He's like singing about the people, you know? It, that's the song, Mi Gente, by um, when Hector Lavo sings it. And I really love the way he sings. And Cedric actually responded to my comment, which was like, again, this is like the first time I've talked to Cedric from at the 
the drive-in and Mars Volta in my life. And, you know, this goes back many years for me, man. Like, this goes back years. And it's like, that's why I have social media, dude. Like, social media is a strange beast. Like, I, I can understand it. It's like, it's, it's not without its darkness, that's for sure. But the bottom line is, I can talk to Cedric from at the drive-in in Mars Volta. I can talk to him. If he, like, maybe he won't respond or something, but I can actually talk to him. Like, even if it's in passing, even if it's digital, it doesn't matter. It's like, I talked to him and he was like, he's like, hey, like my favorite singer is Ismael Miranda, but you know, I love Hector Laveau, so don't make me choose. And I was like, bro, like, <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, you know, excuse me, excuse me. But it was like, it was like good heavens. It was, ext- it was a huge, probably the hugest thing that's happened to me in my life. That same day, I actually stood up for myself at, in my job. I stood up for myself and I told a coworker I wasn't going to do data processing for them. And uh, I stood up for myself and it went well. And then later that day, I talked to Cedric from at the drive-in. Just goes to show, you show a little bit of courage in your life. Awesome. That's basically it. But finding an all-star is amazing. Very, very amazing. Um, and Omar, he's like, that's like a big part of his life is the Fania all-stars is the records they were listening to. Cedric was saying that him and Omar would listen to that during the in casino out era. And then even onwards. And, um, you know, there's a song, uh, there's a de facto has a couple references to Fania all-stars. Uh, if you dig that up, you can kind of understand de facto being the dub project that him, that Omar and Cedric had after at the drive-in. And we'll get to that in a bit. But anyways, you know, I heard Napoleon solo. I had it on Burn C and I was like, this is crazy. And then I heard Relationship Command, the album, and my friend burned me a copy. I remember I had a burned copy of that album. And it's just like, you can't really make records much better than that one with all due respect to like all music. It's like Relationship Command is like a ridiculously good record. It's That's why everyone like lists it as like the record that they love, right? It's because it's a really good record. It's really amazing. It's a, there, there's few musicians in this world that have achieved perfection. I, although I would say that, I mean, I'm, I'm biased. Pretty much every other drive and release is perfect to me, even the new record, which I'll get to, but... I remember I was in Toronto. We went to Toronto to watch a Shakespearean play when I was in high school. We went to Toronto and we went on a day trip to see this Shakespearean play. And we went to Sunrise Records, me and my friend of mine. I remember those Interpol cover, like uh, Interpol posters because um, Antics had just come out, which is fascinating. It's like there's posters in Sunrise Records in Toronto. And again, I was from the suburbs, like an hour and a half outside of Toronto. And I was coming to the big city and it's like, you go into a record store and it's like oh Interpol it's like I listen to Interpol because of The Wedge which is a show on much music at the drive-in actually had videos on The Wedge every now and again you know the thing that's sad about The Wedge closing down is that like that was so integral to me as a kid was The Wedge I would stay up late on Fridays or Saturdays I can't remember which day it came out on it's so long ago but I would stay up late and I would watch The Wedge because there was all this crazy music on there most of Republic Monique um, at the drive-in, like the strokes, the strokes, the first time I heard the strokes was on the wedge, hard to explain. You know, there's all these crazy bands on there and that was the only way I could see alternative, quote unquote, alternative, like independent music before the internet profligated completely and basically ruined all that for, uh, you know, mainstream media. But um, yeah, the strokes, I saw the strokes on there. Oh, I miss I miss the wedge. Interestingly enough, um, Mac DeMarco, if you guys know who that is, he he hosted the very last wedge. You know, I'm sad and jealous that I couldn't host the very last wedge, but it makes sense. Mac DeMarco, Mac D, like, dude, that guy is like he like he is probably the the most popular Canadian musician that's come out of Canada it, since Grimes. Basically, that's why those two Grimes and Mac DeMarco get looped together all the time. That's why they get uh, put together all the time because they're like they were both gigantic superstars who came out of Canada and live in America now. Basically. They're, they're the, these enormous superstars and you I understand why Grimes it, to, it makes total sense she basically makes this crazy techno pop music that's very futuristic sounding plus she's you know she's dating the richest man on the face of the earth 
the richest person on the face of the earth. They have a kid together, which is hilarious because she's she used to make music down in the same block that I make music in now. Not that it's gonna, no, I'm not gonna be dating any rich people. I can barely date anybody, anyways, you know. But I'm not gonna get into that, of course. But Grimes, huge fan. Visions was a hugely influential record. It's one of the reasons I moved here. And Mac DeMarco's two album was one of the reasons I moved to Montreal. But anyways, this podcast is not about them. It's about uh, at the drive-in. So I'm gonna continue on. So we were in a record store, and you know, uh, we were on uh, we were on a school trip to Toronto when back when I was in high school, and I saw a copy of Acrobatic Tenement. Right, Acrobatic Tenement on CD, and I was like, I was like, oh my god, like oh, like I want this. And my friend and I, he, my my friend, this guy Jordan, um, uh, I, I don't know where he's at now. I'll, I'll find, I could find him on the internet, I'm sure. But him and I went splits on it because it was like again, it's twenty seven ninety nine plus tax in 20 in 2006 money so and for high school kids that's exorbitant so him and i had to split on it but we split on it and i had that cd acrobatic tenement acrobatic tenement was recorded on uh was like five hundred dollars five hundred dollars apparently in in that day's money it was recorded with uh that album's amazing skips on records star slight star slight's a really good like pop song interestingly enough star slight jim is on that record omar's on that record and Cedric is on that record the drummer uh, Ryan Sawyer I actually saw him play a show in Montreal I saw him play um, solo he played drums he was opening up for Colin Stetson and Sarah Neufeld playing together which is like so insane I saw that at Salarosa in Montreal and Ryan Sawyer was playing drums and he would just play drums and sing it was very interesting he would just play these like folky kind of songs but he was playing like crazy drums and when he finished I was like dude like you're awesome and also like I came here specifically because you played drums on the first at the drive-in record so thank you like it was amazing he was like okay he's probably a little weirded out because I was just like I was right at the front of the stage too like you know going off but I had to I had to I can be dishonest about such things but yeah Ryan Sawyer was a really good drummer if you listen to Acrobatic Tenement the drums on that record are amazing uh skips on record Porfirio Diaz Ibroglio as well too which is like a classic at the drive-in song very very intense that record sounds amazing you know, when I make my music, I'm like, dude, like if it sounded like Acrobatic Timon, rough and scrappy, like awesome. I think Jim in an interview, Jim Ward was like, yeah, I recorded the guitar takes and I was like, yeah, okay, now we'll put the distortion pedal on it. And the, the record engineer or something was like, oh, no, the guitar takes are done now. Those are it. And he's like, oh, okay. But at the drive-in had a couple EPs before that. They had um, Alfero Vive Alfero Viv Carejo. They had that. Uh, and as well, they had um, Hell Paso. And those are cool EPs. They didn't put that on the compilation. They made a compilation. The station is not operational. That came out when I was in high school or a little bit later. But yeah, I was in high school, basically 2005, 2006, 2007, around there. And they weren't on there. And Jim Ward once said that, like, yeah, it's like if you were at those early shows, then you... Uh, you get the honor of keeping those but uh, we're not going to put them on there and it's and it's interesting because my friend has both those EPs you know he he has all those yeah, the same friend of mine who got me into the band to begin with he has those EPs on vinyl which is like insane and then as well as a bunch of Mars Volta records on vinyl so anyways there's Acrobatic Tenement then the album after that um bloody hell El Gran Orgo that's it El Gran Orgo it's like that album is a weird album because it's very, very pop. It's not pop sounding, but it's very, very produced. It sounds like very professional, but they got ripped off. If you think, if you look historically back to that record, they actually got ripped off on that album, and they said, "Don't buy it because you're you're supporting people who ripped, who robbed us." So that's something to think about. I. I I, uh, I don't know how I got it. I got like a really strange copy of it that had bold print on the cover. It wasn't even the actual album cover. It was just bold print. I, I would love to ask those guys. If I ever had the chance, I would love to ask those guys a little bit about the history. But I don't think they want to talk about it. Like it's like, dude, they got better things to do. Like Cedric has twins. Omar has basically been the pr- most prolific uh, musician in the last like 50 years. Um, Paul, you know, I have no idea where that guy is at. He rules. Uh, Jim Ward, he he didn't rejoin the band fully when they reunited for their newest record. And there's interesting. I'll talk about that in a bit. But he has no interest in that. It's like and Tony. Tony's awesome. I talk to him sometimes on Instagram too. But it's like, dude, it's like 
you know, maybe if those guys, maybe if I had money to give those guys for an interview, I would do it. But I, I just, it's not going to happen anytime soon. And, you know, no worries about that. But anyways, I'll talk to them. If I ever get the chance, I'll ask about that record and see where, where they're at. But they got basically got ripped off on the record. But it's interesting because there's some good songs on there. It actually sounds good. But who cares about that? Because we're going to talk about In Casino Out, baby. In Casino Out! Right from the beginning of that record, it's like Alpha Centauri. It's like... It's like... Oh my god Alpha Centauri Amazing Amazing song um, Chambaras Amazing song That record is like I'm not I, I, I'm already at 30 minutes So I don't want to like Go off about every song But um, That song That album is incredible It's a really good album Alex Newport Helped them make it It's interesting I used to play in this band Many years ago And they actually recorded A single but They recorded a couple songs With Alex Newport He charged them a lot of money And good Good for him It was It's like his time is worth that money because he records with the locust and so many dynamos if you're if you know anything about like the, that kind of history but alex newport did that record and it's an amazing record so, a song though that from that record that's really stuck in my brain um there's many songs in that record that like i love um pretty much all of that that song's uh, one of my i love playing bass along to that album but uh devil among the uh a devil among the tailors that's it devil among the tailors uh, when i was younger i was like what the hell is this and then the older i get it's like um it's like <laughs> And then the ending of the uh, the sad song is like it's like dude if, if you listen to that song it's very easy to understand Mars Volta because it's like Mars Volta is like that except with like horns and like crazy other stuff I love that song I love playing bass along to that record in Casino Out Na Napoleon Solo's on that Alpha Centauri's on that Chambara's on that it's like um and Hourglass is on that and Lopsided Lopsided is on that too um pickpocket oh man at the yo in casino out was a gr is a great album it's a really really good album after in casino out was via that was an ep um I remember buying it actually. I bought it at a record store again, twenty seven, twenty eight ninety nine. It was a lot of money. What I was doing is I was working as a limo cleaner. <laughs> One of my first. No wait, actually no, no, that's not true. Um, I was looking as a limo cleaner before that. I had a job for this like information security company where I was on a computer. And I was just printing off documents, and I got paid in cash. Awesome. It was actually around the corner from where my sister now lives, which is. That's kind of interesting. That's actually kind of interesting now that I think about it. But uh, it was around the corner from where my sister lives. And, uh, you know, completely unrelatedly, but I was printing out these, like, people who bought DirecTV illegally. Like, I was printing out documents about them. <laughs> and I got paid in cash. And the first time I got paid, I was like, I went to the record store. I think it was Encore Records. Yeah, Encore Records in Kitchener. Um, I shouldn't give away too much about myself, but I, I, I you know, it was a small record store where, where I, one of my, one of the people I am was from and I remember buying that via I bought via with that money I one of the one of the things I bought with it I bought a bunch of rec uh, CDs but that was uh, something I bought was via and via is Resquaches it's the first one um, Heliotrope is on there too 300 megahertz uh uh, metronome arthritis, bro. Like metronome arthritis was on that record, um, and 198D. Um, that song is like that's a that song is like the a ballad. You know something that you know something interesting about at the drive in and 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 a lot of Japanese bands that I've gone into is that at the drive in. They even said they're like we don't like people are trying to pigeonhole them as post hardcore emo whatever and they're like they're like we don't care about that stuff like we want to make music the way we want to make music and you know some of our songs are intense and aggressive but some of our songs are like ballads and one one ninety eight D is like a ballad especially the way that the guitar sounds Omar's guitar and that it's like all uh, the delay on it and all this uh, but uh, Metro Arthritis the ending of the song. Uh, do -do 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 Oh my god Heliotrope is a really good song too um, Proxima Centauri <laughs> 
that song rips and there's like a bit of slide guitar in that Omar plays but where Squatch I remember hearing that song and it was like so strange because there's like these weird like techno parts and something interesting about Mars Volta is that they really did a lot of elect- like not electronic but a lot of Aphex Twin sounding parts Aphex Twin you know a lot of like weird like ambient techno kind of parts which some which is again this huge influence on me I wish I could make music like that but I'm just too like wired to make like guitar rock that sort of thing but Vi was a good EP Vi was a good EP but again Relationship Command after that it was like I remember hearing that album that whole album and it was just the greatest thing just the, the just the greatest and I'll talk about it in a second but I remember being on the bus there was a bus that I used to take from school to home and it was like a long bus trip like 30 40 minutes just like I take now that I take the metro to work and it's like 40 minutes you know it was a long trip but I'm used to that but uh I remember seeing a guy on the bus and he was a he was a singer of this local screamo band and I knew who he was because of my space bro I because of my space and I remember like seeing he had a CD wallet because that's what we did we had cd players we had these portable cd players i even used a tape i had a walkman with tapes and what i would do is i would i'd, I'd listen to daft punk or blink 182 on the radio or sloan which is crazy and i would record those songs onto a tape on a on a boom box and then i would put play those mixtapes in my tape player on the way to school but i had cd players man i had tons of cd players y'all y'all who've had y'all who have iphones with spotify on it bro you have no idea i had like CD booklets I would carry in my backpack all the uh, everywhere. One time I got robbed at a skate park. All my sh- all my stuff got stolen, <laughs> and uh, I-, I lost like forty CDs. It was it was uh, it was one of the worst days of my life getting robbed. Damn, I haven't thought about that in a while. But uh, that was one of the worst days that I've ever had in my life. I would say I'm gonna drink to that. Drink water, of course. Poor went out for that day because that, that that day sucked. I got robbed at the skate park when I was seventeen, and it was like I lost my bus pass, I lost my wallet, I lost my I bought I got brand new shoes from America like two weeks before. These really cool Adidas shoes, gone. That's kind of why I bought so many so much skateboard stuff. Like I bought two pairs of Rodney Mullen shoes because it's like you know what. I'll be in debt, sure, but I have cool stuff, and it's like I'm making up for, you know, f- screwing it up when I was a kid. I went skateboarding today. Oh, it was great. I uh, I, I did some ollies. Not like, you know, I'm, I'm still not the best. Uh, you know, of course I'm not the best. I'm not that good, but... Um I did that, some pogos, some truck stands I did as well too. I was try- I'm trying to do, I'm trying to learn how to, uh, and of course practicing kickflips, trying to practice kickflips. Um, yeah, I'm not trying, I am practicing kickflips. I can usually get it to spin right, but I just landing back on it, I have to keep my legs um, in, in a line. Because I, what I do is I, I turn and like, what the hell are you doing? It's like you can't turn, you have to keep yourself in line. It's a, it's a work in progress. Uh, I was also trying 360 flips. And I just can't scoop it. It just can't scoop it. It's like I got to work on it. But I was trying to – I was practicing the scoop and I was practicing the scoop for impossibles. And I can – I'm starting to get like a bit of that. But I love skateboarding. Cedric and Omar, they skateboard too. Like those guys at the drive and skateboarded, which is, again, amazing. But really should be command. It's like let's go through it, baby. It's my podcast. I can go through it if I want. And I had a bit to drink, so I can do what I want in my, my business. Arc Arsenal, first song, starts with maracas, and it's just like... Doo, 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 doo. Dun, 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 it's like, god damn, it's so, so freaking good. So good. And, uh... And it, it goes like that, and then uh, and then patterned against user, dude. I walk around the city every day, and I'm like, I air drum that like literally every day of my life. I'm 31 years old, and I've been doing that since I was 17 or 16 years old. You know, I never stopped doing that. So, patterned against user, one arm scissor. Everybody knows one arm scissor. That's like their. It's so interesting that that's their single. Like that's their one hit wonder, so to speak. I mean, I'm. Putting that very loosely because I would not consider them a one-hit wonder at all. I don't care about their singles. I never give it. I never give a, sh- a darn about their singles or like.
like popular songs that they did. It's not about that to me at all. And that's one of the beauties of that band is that it taught me it's like, hey, you don't have to be an aspiring pop star to make music. You can just make it. You don't have to be a classical musician. You can just make music. That's one of the reasons they really inspired me. It's like, you want to be in a band? Just go do it. Go do it. That's one of the coolest things that I learned from at the drive-in and from hardcore in general. It's just like, yo, you want to be in a band? Do it. Just do it. There's nothing stopping you, like, besides your own mental capacity, you know, and there's a lot of great bands that are, like, not extremely technical proficient, but they're just amazing. Something that comes to mind is the slits. It's like, you listen to the slits, and it's like, they're making weird, oddball music, but it's so dope. It's like, yeah, they, they, didn't, give a, they, didn't, they didn't give a rats. They just did it anyways, you know. But One Arm Scissor, everybody knows it. One time I was at this, uh, I used to do posters for this one company in Montreal, and they had a Christmas party and they had karaoke at Salarosa and I got up and did one arm scissor by at the driving because it was on the list. I was like, what the hell? So I did it and I front flipped off the stage of Salarosa onto my back. You could hear it probably down the street. It was such a big like slapping sound you know and uh, I did that song but it was amazing I got up and killed it like, I was still killing it all the time I, you know I don't I always like I love being on stage I love performing it's like a, it's something that I love very deeply uh, very 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 deeply is performing and I actually did improv tonight for the first time in a long time I did improv and it was it's remote but it's still you know what's interesting it's like it felt mentally the exact same like I was like oh um here's the suggestion okay here's how things are gonna work out here's my mental path and it's like it was the exact same thing as doing it in person except that it's like obviously we're behind a computer but I liked it I actually really liked it maybe I'll talk about I'll do an improv podcast some other time but not today but anyways uh one arm scissor uh the best such a good song I love that track very very deeply and not as not as much as the rest of them. I mean, the song's good, but not as the rest, as, as the rest of them. But anyways, Sleepwalk Capsules. Amazing. Amazing. Um, and the way the guitars work on that record is just like, oh my gosh, it's so good. Invalid Litter Department. Now, Invalid Litter Department, I remember my friends made this cut. Like, I, one of my friends uh, who lived in a kind of m much more affluent neighborhood of the suburbs where I'm from, I got him really into at the drive-in because I was like the harbin harbinger harbinger of like new music like i got i brought like new music like uh prometheus bring fire to humans i bring new music to these to the these guys these kids when i was we were all kids you know we we're all kids we didn't know any better but we'd bring we'd uh, i brought him at the drive and this friend of mine and they made a video covering that song not cut and playing it but lip syncing it anyways that was a that was the same friend of mine who played a mix cd that had miss jackson on it when i was like 11 or 12 and that was like like that was the first time I'd heard Outcast. The first time I heard Miss Jackson, that was extremely influential. Miss Jackson by Outcast was like extremely influential. I still remember hearing it for the first time, and I was like, "What the hell is this? It's so good! It's unbelievably good." So that was, I mean, that's a huge influence. I've done that song at karaoke. That's my song at karaoke. Is like, is Miss Jackson, but. Anyways, Invalid Apartment, though all that you know, fun and stuff inside. That song is a very sad song. It's a very sad song, and the video is extremely sad. You know, very, very sad. And I'm not going to be sitting here joking. It's like, you know, it's about all these women who are murdered trying to get to work, trying to get to work at these factories, and it's just like... Something about at the driving, something about all those guys from El Paso, you know, and they're across the river, across the across the border from Juarez in Me in Mexico, basically, and they just you know they've seen some hard times all those guys i mean at the drive-in toured insanely if you know the history of at the drive-in it's like they never stopped touring like they toured insanely they toured all over the country to nobody until they were very very popular and then they they split and we'll get to there but they played to nobody that really inspired me because it's like they're playing to nobody i'll play to nobody like i'll do the same thing just because 
if, they, if it's good for them, it's good for me. And I did that. I actually, many of the bands I played in, we played to nobody. And I loved it. I loved every second of it. You know, even though I never made money from it, I loved it. It was never about the money. That's the thing with music and me and art. It's like, it's not about the money at all. I'll work a job. I, I actually love the job that I have currently. I actually love my job, which is my surprise, y'all. Of course, there's some things that come up that are like, oh, like, oh. But I have a great job in, in Montreal. I'm very, very fortunate very lucky to have that but you know i'll do whatever it takes to make a living because that's what i have to do basically is to make art and make music is to is to do that so uh at the driving taught me that too because all those guys they work tons of weird jobs to make their band work you know call centers uh restaurants gas stations whatever they all had to do it tony was a chemist teacher chemistry teacher if i'm not mistaken or an engineering teacher in, in a school before like they before the uh, I think before they made In Casino Out even. So it's like, that's a, that's a big lesson from that band. It's like, yo, do what you love because you love it. Not because it's going to make you a living and make you money. I mean, they made money later on, which is good for them because they deserve it. But it's just like, that's not what making art is about necessarily. Um, although it helps. And touring, I mean, now that we, we live in COVID, the COVID era, this is going to, saying that's going to date this podcast quite well, but it's like, there's no music industry right now. It's totally like it's completely demolished entirely there's no music industry whatsoever because there's no live shows that's where the money is is, is playing shows and touring so all the best bands they tour and they, that's you know they might not make a lot of money but they're at least they're playing shows and they're still making some money and if they're really good they play big shows and make money you know but um at the driving taught me that like you didn't need to play big shows or be a huge artistic success or a huge success in general monetarily to do what you love and that's something that i've i've kept my whole life and like I said, I love my job. I love what I do. It's very, very engaging and interesting when it when it gets going. It's really good. But I would do whatever it takes to keep making art and keep making music. And uh, I'll knock on wood so that I don't get in trouble or nothing. But uh, you know how it is. In Val Letter Apartment, though, um, yeah, it's the video is very sad. Um, it's very, very sad. But um, but nothing. It is so. Shout out to them for making that and to bring awareness because how would I know? You know, I live in suburban Canada, suburban Ontario, Canada. I had no idea of the plight of these women. You know, I had no idea. And after watching that video, it's like, oh, like, thank you. Because I understand, like, any way I could help, I, I wish I could, I wish I could help because they brought a, they brought a, a spotlight to that. And that, and good for them. I saw that video on the wedge in the letter department. And it's like good, good, you know. Um, anyways, uh, what was the song after that? I can't remember the title of the song, but it's like. Yeah. Anyways, I don't mean to get too energetic, you know, after all this, but it's like that's a good song too. Uh, I can't remember. <laughs> The thing is with Out the Driving is that I don't really remember some, like some, um, a lot of song titles I remember, but some of the ones on In Casino Out are like, I just don't remember because I just remember what it feels like to listen to them, but I never cared about the title or the lyrics, you know? Now that I'm older, I actually pay attention to the lyrics a little bit more than I, now that I've listened to Joni Mitchell and like, you know, the band or like Bob Dylan or whatever. So I actually like pay attention to the lyrics a bit more. But back when I was a kid, I never gave a, sh I never gave a damn about that stuff. I would just be like, oh, I liked how it sounded, so... Um, Enfilade is after that And Iggy Pop is on that track He's at the very beginning uh, Listening of Ransom Demands That's another cool song because you can hear the You can hear the transition to Mars Volta Because they have more like weird techno elements Weird techno elements And uh, like weird Electronica parts and that sort of thing It's, it's a bit more experimental Really good song, good bass line uh, As well after that is Rolodex Propaganda. That song rips. Like that part really rips. I really, really love that part. Uh, I remember watching a, there's a video of them. I, I don't know if it's on Jules Holland they were playing, or they're playing it on some British show or something. But they played Rolodex Propaganda and Omar's guitar broke in like the first 10 seconds or 15 seconds. So he just ended up like clapping and like playing. I I, I don't know if he was playing tambourine 
Wolverine or something even but he just didn't play guitar and he was just he was dancing and like living it. and I remember watching that and I was like dude that's it um, with that the drive-in like when Kazaa and LimeWire came out a couple of years later when I was in high school uh, 2004 2005 2006 when we had LimeWire and Kazaa I would download at the drive-in videos and one of the ones I saw was them playing at Big Day Out I saw a couple of, like you know um you know, Cosmonaut, that performance, at Arc Arsenal, that performance. When they played Big Day Out, Pattern Against User, that that performance, I saw those on Big Day Out. And that was 2000, 2001 or something when they played. And I had those videos and I was like, what? This is like, that was like the first time I'd seen them perform. Like, and I was like, oh, this is what the band is? I was blown away. Especially because like Omar and Cedric, they're like, they're dancing and the way they dance is like, I was like, that's what I want to do. I just want to dance like that. I just want to dance on stage and like throw my guitar and like flip out and play. That's what I want to do. I remember too, Cosmonaut, uh, no, not Cosmonaut, Cosmonaut was amazing, that video of Big Day Out, but Pattern Against User, it starts and Cedric is like, it's like, this is dedicated to the band from the UK called The Fall. If you don't know who The Fall is, you've been listening to too much hip-hop and heavy metal. And I was like, who is The Fall? And it took me years to listen to The Fall. I didn't even know what the hell that was. I just I just liked that he was like, he's like, I don't give a, he, I don't give a damn what, what's going on right now. I, don't, I do not give a damn at all. Like, I'm just going to say my piece. And then later on, you know, in that show, he's like, you guys don't know what you're doing. Like, you're just copying what people do on... You know what's interesting is that like in that show Cedric really calls out bro kind of culture and I say bro I love saying the word bro because it's like it's just it feels good but he was calling out the real macho part of hardcore just like Fugazi it's like really interesting because if you know Fugazi you know that they they would stop people from like moshing hard and like pushing people down because they'd be like they'd stop in the middle of a set and be like hey like you need to behave yourself, you know, accordingly. Stop, like, a, like aggressively going against uh, the women in the crowd or the shorter people in the crowd, the less strong people. It's just interesting because um, at the drive-in, it's very similar. It's like we don't want this macho bullshit. And I think something that's interesting that's happened in the last, like, 15 years maybe is that, like – that kind of macho bull stuff, I shouldn't have cursed because my mon- my channel get demonetized. Not that that matters because it's not, it's, you don't get monetized with 17 subscribers, bro. But there's not that many people who are that aggressive at shows. And when it, when people are aggressive or like it, uh, inappropriately aggressive, I could say, like, I mean, if you go to see Hatebreed or you go to see like a band at Foof's in Montreal, downtown Montreal, you know, um, like a death metal band, it's like, yeah, of course people are going to, di- like, they're going to do crazy moshing and stuff like that. But um, at the drive-in really made a stand about it too, just like Fugazi where they're like, hey, like, no, we're not going to have this macho bullshit here. Part of my language, but we're not going to have this here. Like, we want to have people dancing and enjoying the show. We don't want to have that, like people pushing each other down to the ground or hurting each other. And that's respect, you know, that's, that's, that's a good thing. You know, um, it's just interesting because many years later when at the drive, when we reform back in like 20, now they reformed in 2012, but what I'm talking about specifically is when they reformed in like 2017 and 2018, they were playing shows and Cedric would be like stage diving and crowd surfing and good for him. Like you want to get involved with the crowd because nowadays people are not that crazy like they don't do crazy stuff they, they'll watch a show but they don't even dance that much in my experience so anyways all that to say um lime war and Kazaa, that's where i downloaded at the drive-in videos when i was a kid just so i could see what they were and it was amazing now we have youtube this is before youtube so any of y'all watching this it's like can you imagine a time before youtube you probably can't you probably can't i remember when youtube came out and i thought it was a complete novelty i was like this is gonna be gone in like a couple months or a year or something but i was extremely wrong I mean, my intuition is sometimes very wrong i remember my friend made comedy videos and i was like what the hell is this like this is ridiculous and now look at this you're watching this on youtube no here we are right so rolodex propaganda amazing song amazing guitar parts cedric plays guitar on that song he, uh, amazing um quarantined is after that quarantine is like a really like that's like a kind of like a mars volta song of sorts in a way because it's very atmospheric it's a very atmospheric song 
um, like non-zero possibility, which we'll get to, but they're kind of similar, very atmospheric and heavy. They're noisy at parts, but they're heavy and atmospheric. Then Cosmonaut. Cosmonaut has like one of my favorite parts of all time where it's like, like, even in one of my Mad Angel songs, I'm not going to say which one so that I don't get hit for copyright or something. <laughs> but one of my songs, I have a guitar part, and it's very inspired by that. It's very, very inspired by that. I always wanted to find a way that I could bring my At The Driving influence through my own music, and Mad Angels is an extension of that, so I'm very, very thankful and grateful for that, for sure. For sure, bro. For sure, bro. <laughs> Cosmonaut, amazing, amazing live video too, amazing live video, and then non-zero possibility is after that, and it's just like non-zero possibility, like is another ballad. It's kind of like 198D, but different. It's another ballad. I remember in my high school, a person, a, a kid in our high school would commit suicide every year. All four years I was in high school, one kid would commit suicide, which to me now is thinking about it and bringing that up. It's so gnarly, you know. Sorry for bringing that up, but it's like, damn, like. It was tough. Like, we knew some of these kids, too. Like, we knew these people, and it was just like, okay, well, what are we going to do? You know, that that was – it was very tough. And I remember one of my friends, um, this person I played in a band with, my first ever band we played together in, we used to cover La Tigre's Decepticon, among us other things. But we, my first ever band that I played in, really, that played shows and did something, uh, the person that band, um, you know, they were really upset – uh, because one of the kids in our class, not in our class, but in our grade had committed suicide, unfortunately. And I played her, <laughs> I played her non-zero possibility and, and it was all right. It was in home economics. It was in the food class. I remember, I remember in that class, I would just listen to Rage Against the Machine and stuff and uh, try to make sense of all this, you know, but, um, yeah, I, my high school was very strange. It was an arts high school. Uh, what I got one time they had a school show every year um, called Many Moods and Music, and I got in a couple shows, especially in grade in grade eleven and grade twelve, when I was really playing music a lot. And I remember I was, you know, I'd be in my my house, my parents' suburban house where we lived, and after I'd come home from school, I'd go home and I'd plug in my electric guitar into this Boss bass, no, this um Digitech, sorry, uh, bass multi effects. I was borrowing it from a friend of mine who, my friend, this friend that I bought it from. His wife, actually, we're still friends. We still communicate on Instagram nowadays. After all these years, she's like one of the oldest friends that I technically have in my life, besides my best friend who got me into at the drive-in to begin with and got me into all this. But... Um, I borrowed this guy's bass effects pedal and I used to just play along in my room with my, sh my my crappy practice amp and just like throw my guitar and like dance in my room and I was like I, and in my mind I was like I'm practicing for when I get to play shows because I really want to play shows that's what I want to do and I would practice and play with this bass effects you know put delay on all this put all this stuff on uh, and you know chorus flange or whatever and put it all on and dance in my room and finally I got the chance in high school to play on stage and I just went nuts uh, the, the one song I was in there's two songs I was in in grade 11 one of the songs was In the Waiting Room by Zero Seven which is a very chill song the singer of that song was very gorgeous and I think she actually liked me she actually had a thing for me but I was just too stupid like stupid and didn't understand the world and was too stupid to understand that and to like act on it whatever everyone <laughs> sounds like the story of my life but then I played uh, I Want You to Want Me by Cheap Trick and I threw I remember I was playing on stage and I was throwing my guitar around and like dancing on stage and everyone's like dude like Everybody else is like chilling and this guy's just like flipping out on stage. And again, that's all thanks at the drive-in. That's all thanks at the drive-in because that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to throw my guitar around and play and play with feeling. Play with some feeling because I'm from a classical music family. So it's like I wanted to get up and play some music with some bloody feeling in it, you know. And, you know, classical music has feeling, but it's it's so learned and it's much different than, you know, what at the drive-in is, which is like – emotion emotion and and playing strange notes and progressions and that sort of thing so there's also catacombs uh, on the bonus one of the bonus tracks uh, on um, 
on uh, Relationship Command. There's another song too. I can't remember what the song is called. Extracurricular. How can I forget? Yeah, Extracurricular. And again, that's that's all of Relationship Command. Uh, amazing record. Hugely influential record on me. And then After Driving broke up. And they broke up. It's I've watched a lot of interviews and read a lot of interviews, and it's very. It's because Omar he's just like I don't want to like I don't want to be pigeonholed anymore. I'm done. Like I'm done with this. Like he was like you know everyone was saying to him apparently they're like why did you quit? Like you were gonna make so much money. You're touring with Rage Against the Machine and stadiums. Like you're on TV, and he's like yeah I don't care. I don't care about that stuff. Something that Omar talks about a lot in his interviews is like his aversion to being an entertainer and to play music for people who are like hey dance for us monkey that's what he says point blank he literally says that he's like I'm not down with playing music for people who are like hey dance for me monkey and when they went out the drive and reunited and was playing shows in like 2012 people would do that they're like why aren't you dancing like why aren't you flipping on it's like yo like don't tell me what to do how about that don't tell me how to perform don't tell me how to make my music. It's like he even said in an interview, it's like I wanted to bash their faces in when they were like trying to like yell stuff at me. And it's like, oh, it's like that's why Omar is like my number one artistic influence of all time um, with, you know, it's just because like he's a real artist. He's a real artist. He makes art. You know, he's an artist. He's not an entertainer. He's not a panderer. He's not someone who's like trying to make stuff for other people it's like no i make what i want to make and that's what comes out and i thankfully make a living from it but i do what i want to do and that that's something i respect extremely deeply and you know i'm a big admiration for him and i hope it's come across in this podcast but anyways after driving broke up and Omar called it quits and Cedric went with him and then they started de facto which is like their re- it's like their dub band like dub project really really cool with Jeremy Ward rest in peace of course and and Ike Owens also rest in peace of course I mean Ike wasn't in the band originally but it was those three guys Jeremy and Omar and Cedric and De facto is really awesome. Legend of the Four Tales, Scorpion, uh, Cordova. I love that song. Uh, Megaton Shop Blast. I bought that CD in the store. Uh, Jim Ward, Tony Hajar, and Paul Hanos. They they started Sparta uh, with Matt Miller, who plays bass, who's been playing bass in Sparta pretty much the whole time. Sparta was cool. I really liked Sparta when I was in high school. I really, really liked Sparta because I was really into Jimmy World and I was really into like that. Like Sparta wasn't too dissimilar from At The Drive-In. I had a Sparta shirt from West 49, an old skate shop. West 49 doesn't even sell skateboards anymore. They sell scooters or completes or like really weird complete decks, but nothing like they don't actually sell decks like real decks like a real skate shop anymore they're not really a real skate shop anymore which i was fascinated by when i went to branford which is where my parents are from but anyways uh, i bought a sparta shirt from there when i was very very young and i had that for a while i love sparta um wiretap scars of course and uh porcelain and uh, threes I, I got all those records when i was in high school and sparta's still doing things like jim ward still does things with sparta i actually talked to jim ward the, like yet yesterday or two days ago he posted a f- again this is the beauty of social media this is why i have social media i don't have it for any other reason than than this excuse me but jim ward he was like he posted a photo which which, which had a bit of his guitar it was kind of cropped out from what it was but and a pedal and i i could i could tell that the guitar was like a jaguar or, or a jazz master by fender one of those and i was like hey what well, is it jazz master or jaguar and he was like oh it's a jag and it's like boom i talked to cedric the other day and i talked to jim ward the other day so you know, a lot of cases and a lot of arguments can be made against social media, but for my purposes, that's all I want it for. I just want to talk to the people that I admire, my heroes, you know. I don't care about the rest of it. I got to watch out for getting addicted to it, like like counts and that sort of thing. But if I can talk to Jim Ward or Cedric or like any of the members from that band and talk to them, even just a little bit, it's like... To me, when I was a kid, like I went on this one site. There's this site that was on the internet. It was like Rolodex, FR or something. It was like this independently run site, and it's all about at the drive-in. And I remember I was in high school, like on my computer, and I would look it up and just look up pictures and look up the information, interviews, guitar tabs, anything I could, anything I could, because it was all like, this is what I want. This is what I want to get into. So. 
After the driving broke up, Sparta and Mars Volta. De facto was first, but then Mars Volta started to form. And I think I'm going to make a... We're at an hour mark right now, so I'm not going to get into Mars Volta. Mars Volta, for me, warrants its own podcast. That warrants like an hour at least of its own talking. So I'm not going to talk about it. So I'll talk about that some other time. But... Um, so many years go by now many years go by they re at the driving reunited for 2012 for coachella apparently coachella in, as omar said in interviews coachella asked them like multiple times every year to reunite for their festival every single year they would throw like ridiculous amounts of money at them and they just wouldn't do it and then finally they did in 2012 and unfortunately, Omar's mother passed away like right before the show happened. And a lot of people were like, why isn't he dancing? Like, why, are, why aren't they? Fl why is he flipping out? And it's like, dude, respect, you know, like if my mother had passed away, my mother's a hero of mine. My mother's a huge musical and artistic. And also like, it's, that's where I come from, man. It's like, of course, like I totally understand. Not like, you know, I'm not going to dance like a monkey for you, for you people. It's like, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm going to play this. And he still actually played the songs to his credit. He still got up and did it, you know, and he didn't have to. He could have he walked away and he didn't. He did it. But people were tripping out about that. But I never I, I, I could have uh, some friends of mine went to see the 2012 Coachella. Uh, I thought about going, but I just didn't go. I, I've never seen at the drive and play. I'm actually kind of happy that I didn't because to me. Every time I've seen my hero play, it makes me want to emulate them less. <laughs> and what I mean by that is like every time I've seen a band play that I've like idolized or like got really into, it's like once I see them, I'm like, oh, okay, okay. And then it's like, whatever. I actually saw Bosnian Rainbows. Maybe I'll talk about that. But I saw Bosnian Rainbows in Toronto, which is Omar's band with Nikki Casper and D'Antoni Parks and uh, Terry Genderbenner as well. And I saw them play and it was amazing. I actually, the first song Omar broke his strap when they were playing, it was at the Opera House in Toronto. And he broke his strap and I was so stoked because that's something that happened to me all the time when I'd play shows. My strap would break and I was like, dude, that's it right there. But I remember a very strange memory. I was taught, I was, Omar was like, thank you very much for coming. And I was like, oh, it really means a lot to us. You know, and I should have said me, but, but he's like, he, he had this weird look on his face and I was like, oh shit, I was, shoot. I shouldn't have said anything, you know, I shouldn't have said anything. So give me a second. I'm gonna have a bit of a uh, bit of red wine here. Hope I don't get in trouble from YouTube, bro. Okay. Anyways, I've never seen at the drive and play a show. Never. And I'm kind of glad because to me, now they live, they're mortal in my soul because it's kind of like Nirvana. It's like, I'll never see Nirvana play, you know? I don't care if Paul McCartney's helming the band. It's like, I love Paul McCartney and I love Dave Grohl and Chris Novoselic, but it's like, and Pat, and Pat Smear, but like, I'm never going to see Nirvana and I'm never going to see at the drive in. You know, they're never going to play. Maybe they will. Maybe maybe when COVID's over, they'll they'll play again. But I'll never see them, and they live on in my heart forever. And forever, I'm gonna try to be like them because I want to try and play shows that I wasn't able to see. And my shows, especially Mad Angels, Mad Angels specifically, is like <laughs> it's it's meant to be like that. It's like I, I'm I'm trying to make dance music, but without the driving guitars. Really, that's what I'm trying to do. But they reunited. Jim Ward was in the band for a bit, but he left the band. He talked about that. He said that like he's he said this in an interview, but he's like at the drive and never worked as a big band, never worked as like a big popular band. He said once that like when they were meeting with like record executives, he would have like an ulcer, which is something he said. But thankfully they got on Mike D's record label and Omar actually talks about this. They were on uh, this digital network and they were releasing videos. This is before YouTube. There's actually, you can find these videos, these comedy videos, but at the drive was making these comedy videos on the internet and releasing the music on the internet. And this was, way before like YouTube way before anything this was like 2000 what well, like two, 1999 2000 so it's important to note that it's like dude like they were really ahead of their time in many ways and that's an example but they were on Mike D like Mike D from the Beastie Boys right and they were on the Grand Royal that's Relationship really Command originally came out on Grand Royal and that's what happened and uh 
again, that further proved to me that like hip hop and at the drive in, it's like they're the same. They're like in the same thing. That's why my music now, it's like it is those two things. It's like hip hop and at the drive in. That's what I'm aspiring to do really with Mad Angels specifically. So. Anyways, they made a new record. Um, Jim left the band. Like, he left the band. He was going to tour with them or anything, which makes sense because Jim Ward is, like, a re- he's he has a lot of integrity and, like, he has a lot. He just, like, does his thing, you know. he He's unapologetic about it, too, which is really cool. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, Keely Davis, who played in Sparta, he was the lead guitarist in Sparta on the album Threes, he actually became the new guitar player and backup vocalist on in at the drive-in which is fascinating because it's like wow keep it in the family tony and paul have already played with keely keely davis by the way it's a wicked skateboarder he's a wicked good skateboarder bro like so good at skateboarding he was actually a pro not a pro but he was sponsored when he was a kid if you look in an interview with him and he had that sick gretsch guitar without the driving but regardless keely davis became the guitar player they released the album inter alia basically inter alia came out and the, the thing about i noticed about that and i'm, I'm gonna wrap up the podcast soon because we passed the hour mark but inter alia was like you really you really notice that jim ward isn't in the band because when you listen to like the older out the driving albums there's this like, there's this emo like jimmy world like afi element to it where it's like this emo like melodic uh promise ring comes to mind or captain jazz comes to mind very melodic emo kind of part of it and when you listen to inner alia that that part is absent it's absent you know it's it's very aggressive it's a very aggressive album and it's a great record i listened to it a lot actually i liked it a lot i still do there's really good songs on there um call broken arrow has a sick chorus oh call broken arrow it's always ball this is sick that's so sick uh, there's a lot of good songs on there. Governed by Contagions. Um, the song at the beginning. And then, um, oh, what's the other song? I can't remember the name. It's like... Uh, I love that track. Um, bloody hell, I can't remember. Hostage something. Hostage something. Ah, man, I should have done my research before the podcast. We're at an hour and ten minutes, so whatever. But um, Inner Alia was a good record. But again, it's very aggressive aggressive it's it's like very aggressive without any kind of emo kind of parts of it there's not like a lot of like melodic ballad parts there's really no ballads on that record there's a slower song on that record but it's not a ballad um it's very interesting i feel like with inner alia jim ward is missing like you can really sense that he's not there um on that record and again i'm not saying that as a negative i'm not saying that as a bad thing i'm saying that is that's how it is that's just life you know and it's still a great record i still love listening to that record i have it on cd and i have a jacket from the era i have a, I have a jacket it's in my closet i got this shirt out so i'm not gonna pull up my jacket but i've got a jacket from that area it's got out of the driver on the side i'm gonna wear that tomorrow or something i haven't worn it in a while but um but yeah Inner Alia was really good. Then they had the uh, Diamante. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, but Diamante, they had that EP after Inner Alia. That one's cool. It's very similar to Via, which I thought was cool. It has like a weird techno kind of part to parts to it but uh very interesting and then they split up again and i'll tell you this like when i i saw a video of their last show that they played the very end of the set too actually very specifically the end of the set and the very last show that they played i think it was 2018 or something and omar just throws his guitar down and just walks off stage and i was like oh like no wonder that's the last show they played it's like he's probably like yeah i'm sick of this you know then maybe not maybe i'm wrong but it's like he's like yeah i'm done even for him he talks a lot about how difficult it is to like redo at the driving because like a lot of those songs it's like he made those when he was like in high school like they made those songs when they were in their early 20s yeah i could play some songs from my early 20s maybe i wouldn't do that on mad angels but um i do have a i do have another solo project i have two solo projects mad angels is my my weirdo post hardcore post punk math rock hip-hop experimental project uh uh, but i have another solo project i'm not going to do any cross posts but i can understand he's like this is i I don't want to do this you know it seemed like that he's like i don't want to do this anymore you know i'm good i could be wrong but um you know maybe they'll come back or something but anyways in was a good record though it's still good like i still liked it i bought it for my friends i bought it for my sister 
older and I bought it for my friends um, as a gift but uh, I still have a copy of it too I like it it's just aggressive it's an aggressive album like without like that emo under underbelly like I was telling you but I'll talk about Mars Volta in another podcast that uh, Mars Volta deserves like a long podcast it definitely deserves like a at least an hour of talking so I'm gonna do that but all this to say you know at the drive-in you know in conclusion just ending uh, I'm gonna wrap things up now wrap it up because we're basically at the 114 mark now or whatever I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them straight up I wouldn't I wouldn't be here I wouldn't exist as I do now artistically if it wasn't for at the drive-in at all I wouldn't and I have them to thank for that and I thank them for it because they gave me they gave my adult self a sense of purpose it's like I love music my parents are musicians I was born from musicians and you know I wanted to they tried to get me into piano and I quit because I was just like I was like I'm not gonna do it's just too boring but at the drive-in it's like this is what I want to do I just want to play I want to put delay on my guitar and play it really experimentally and and all that to say it's like they really inspired me to be a better person and to be a musician to be and to experiment and to get out there and experience new things like salsa music you know like I would never listen to Fonny All Stars if it wasn't for them or dub music same thing like I saw Lee Scratch Parish play a show and I probably wouldn't have seen that if I had not known about dub music beforehand uh, but even like bands that they were like they were touring with like Jimmy World I never really listened to the Murder City Devils but I know that one of the members of the Murder City Devils played in uh, Murder City Devils sorry played in uh, uh, played Modest Mouse, which is interesting. Dan Gallucci, I think. I could be wrong, sorry. but And then John Theodore played in Golden. Then he played in the Mars Volta. And I'll talk about that when I do the Mars Volta podcast. That'll be in a couple episodes. I think my next Mad Angels podcast, I don't know what I'm going to do it about exactly. Maybe I'll do it about, uh, maybe I'll do it about improv just to keep it specific because I've been doing, I did that last tonight and it was quite fun, but uh, we'll see. I'm going to take a little bit. I, I Like I said, I have to finish my record. My record, that's the cover. I have to finish it. I, I really want to get that finished. So I really want to be working on that every spare moment that I have from now on. So I'm probably going to do that, but uh all this to say, everybody, um, if you watch this all the way to the end, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Gracias as well. Thank you. I really appreciate uh, you listening to this and paying attention to this. If, if you took any wisdom from this, amazing. Uh, that's great. Um, I, I'm, I could talk about this for a much, much longer, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably cut it at this point. But at the drive-in, it's like, how you could talk about them forever. It's just like... They did it, and there's so many videos you can talk about. The Schoolhouse video when they play live, that's amazing. Uh, any of the t- television performances on, like, Conan O'Brien or whatever, amazing. Uh, they got me to everything that I am. They are they are what everything I am. And the fact that I can communicate with some of the members on the Internet is incredible. It's very, very incredible, and I, I don't take it for granted because it's the best. So... Anyways, thank you very much for watching this. Thank you very much for paying attention. And go listen to At The Drive-In, dude. Go put on In Casino Out. Go put on Relationship Command. Go listen to Acrobatic Tenement. Go listen to, not El Gran Orgo, but, uh, you know, don't buy, at least don't buy it. But go listen to Via. Go listen to Inralia. Go listen to all that. You know, it's interesting because... At the drive-in played with Rammstein, which is again another one of my favorite bands. I'll probably do a podcast about Rammstein specifically in the future. But uh, at the drive-in did uh, played a show. They played Rock Fest in Quebec, and my friend the other day, I was like, I, I was like, oh, I didn't go because I don't know anyone who camps. And he's like, that's a lame excuse. That's a weak excuse, dude. Like, that's a bad excuse. And I was like, you're right. Like, I should have gone to see my two favorite bands of all time. Um, at the drive-in and the Rammstein to, to a lesser extent, but I should have seen them play when I had the chance and I didn't. And now here we are in COVID. I was supposed to see Rammstein last summer. That didn't happen. I still have my ticket relatively, but it's like, is it ever going to happen? We don't know. We're all stuck here waiting for vaccines. Like I said, when we're the vaccine, I'll snort it. I don't give a damn. But, um, 
Shout out to Omar. Shout out to Cedric. Shout out to Tony. Shout out to Paul. Shout out to Jim Ward. Shout out to Kahili Davis. Shout out to Ryan Sawyer. Shout out to all the members of the band that were in the band, except for Ben Rodriguez. If you know the history of El Granorgo, no, no shout out to that guy. Apparently, the song Concertina, from what I've heard on the internet, was about the one of the members of the band during El Granorgo. How about how how bad of a person that guy was? I don't know for sure. You'd have to talk to those guys about it but that's just what i heard but shout out to like you know shout out to omar shout out to cedric shout out to tony shout out to jim shout out to paul shout out to keely davis shout out to you guys thank you very much for making the music that you do and making the art that you did because i wouldn't have a life i wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that so i have to thank you very much and to you the listener Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much for listening to my podcast, for paying attention to what I'm doing. I really appreciate it. So um, if you have anything, if there's anything you want to add in the comments, put it in the comments, like and subscribe. Ha 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 ha. Like and subscribe. I'm serious because that's, you know, um, my, my videos will spread around more if people like and subscribe to the channel, like the videos, that sort of thing. But merci beaucoup. Gracias. I really appreciate everything that y'all, y'all people paying attention to me. And I think I'm going to end it up this so go listen at the drive-in seriously and if there's anything i'll miss i'll just do part two you know what i'll do another podcast about the drive-in i don't give a damn i'll I'll just do it it's no big deal so anyways thanks very much for your time everybody and uh i'm gonna have my record up in s- as soon as possible i'm gonna get my re- i'm gonna have my full album up on youtube so the full album is gonna be on youtube and uh some singles will be on youtube as well too so i'm gonna have some singles and then some the full album so you can listen to it for free and whether you listen to it or not i don't care i'm gonna put it on there anyways so go listen to it if you want um my live set that i did on new year's that still stands up i actually love listening to that in live set so it's great but um, uh, anyways, I, this has been a pleasure. Shout out to Improv. Shout out to Montreal Improv. It was awesome doing improv again. Amazing. And uh, shout out to skateboarding. Because skateboarding makes me feel amazing. Shout out to Footbag. Makes me feel amazing too. Uh, shout out to all this. And shout out to all y'all. Shout out to At The Drive-In. Uh, merci beaucoup. Tout le monde. I'll bid you all farewell. Thank you for watching. And have a really great... Whatever you're going to have a great day. So, bye y'all. Peace.